Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 241. No one can stop you from doing exactly what you want to do if you can accept that the cavalry won't come and that if you can be that cavalry, it gives you a chance to be happy. Mark Duplass. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content, and you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Unknown is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post-sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley, ADR, and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post-sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Now, today's episode is extremely special, guys, because I was privileged to sit and listen to two of, uh, honestly, my idols, people that, uh, filmmakers that really got me off my ass to go make my first film, This Is Meg, and continue to inspire me on my second feature on the corner of Ego and Desire. And those guys are the Duplass brothers. They were the first uh, time that I heard what they did with Puffy Chair, their first feature film, where they just went out and did it and didn't really wait around for permission and just kind of went and did it and, and, and didn't really care about how it looked or whatever. They cared more about story and performance. And, and, and it really just inspired me. So I had an opportunity to see them uh, give us a lecture at one of their book signings for their new amazing book, Like Brothers. I've read the book and it tells the entire story of how they – um, made it into Hollywood and how they changed the rules of how they are making films. And it's really inspirational. Uh, and also a whole other sections of the book are all about working with brothers, working with uh, siblings and how to get along and how to collaborate and, uh, and that whole world as well. So it's a wonderful read. And, uh, I wanted to, uh, to hear what these guys had to say. And I was able to record most of their talk. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little, lead into where the recording is going to pick up. They're talking about their very first short film, which is called This Is John. And he did it back in 2003. And basically the way it was is they were both sitting in their uh, little apartment in Austin, Texas. And Mark turned to Jay and said, today we're making a movie. And Jay was like, what are you talking about? We don't have a 60 millimeter camera. We don't have crew. We don't have lights. We don't have actors. He goes, I don't care. We're going to go make a movie. Let's grab mom and dad's video camera, home video camera. Uh, I'm going to go to the store and get a tape for $3, and you've got 15 minutes to come up with a story. And he bolted. So since he didn't have a lot of time to figure out a story, he came up with the idea of basically what happened to him earlier in the week where he was trying to set his outgoing message on his answering machine and literally having a nervous breakdown about it. And that is where we pick up the story uh, where the boys are talking. So really enjoy the rest of this uh, episode, guys. It, these guys are super inspirational. And I'm going to have a bunch of cool stuff at the end of the episode. You can see the $3 short film and a ton of more resources and more talks that Mark and Jay do uh, in the show notes and all that kind of stuff. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But until then, enjoy Mark and Jay Duplass. And I was um, trying over and over again. I couldn't get it right. 
and I pretty much had a nervous breakdown. And when Mark's another mild, it was a mild one. <laughs> you might want to cue it up now because this is what we're going to show. Um, so um, I told Mark the idea, and he said, "Cool." And he got dressed in my Kelly. I, I, I was doing like temp work, and it was called the Kelly People. And you would, you know, I had one button-up shirt and some slacks. That's all I owned other than like, you know, just sweatpants at that point. And he put the shirt on and he looked at the tag and we saw that on the tag it said John Ashford and we were like, okay, that's your name. <laughs> and, and, he, and he walked outside and he said, roll camera, um, I'm coming in. <laughs> and, and this is the movie. <laughs> is that we shot one 20 minute take. Um, our friend David Zellner, who's uh, part of another brother filmmaking team, helped us edit that down to about seven minutes. And we didn't feel like, you know, it was gonna be the greatest film in the world, but we definitely felt like we had broken through and told something that was very specifically, uh, let's watch it again, show it again. <laughs> Very specific to us, very unique to our, our sensibility, you know? We weren't trying to be the Coen brothers, we were just making fun of ourselves and the way we do things. Um, and so we're like, well, what do we do with this? We don't know. And then we submitted it to like a couple of film festivals on a lark, one of which was Sundance, and we got into Sundance that year. And um, it was the worst looking movie that had ever played the Sundance Film Festival. And it, it, I don't know if you notice, it's a dead pixel right in the center of the frame. Um, but it was also the worst sounding movie. Which is also, yeah, it's just good, so we had that going for us. Um, but it really connected with people, there was something in it, and, and I think we have tried to stay as close to this process um, as we can, which is basically, you know, the artists, our, our young filmmakers are always asking us, like, you know, how do I get started? And, and besides failing for 12 years, which we try to tell them to avoid, it's kind of that thing where, like, those little conversations you're having with your loved one or your best friend or, or someone that's, like, two in the morning and you're, like, giggling uncontrollably about something you're confessing to them when you get, like, you know, you get those sh shivers in the shower remembering something horrible and embarrassing that you did. Like, if you can identify that and share it and communicate it, like, that tends to be, like, kind of what, where the stuff is. So we've basically been trying to do that since. And, Jay, do you think you recognized that at the moment, then, that you had maybe finally sort of broken through and, like, discovered what your guys' voice could be? No. I was, I was just depressed and obliterated. No, but you had, we did have a moment where we were like, something interesting has happened. I, what I did know at the time, I mean, I was just blanketed by decades of failure, you know? I mean, uh, what, what I did know is that we had captured something that we had never captured before. Like, something happened in front of me, and it was very private and personal to me and Mark. This was nothing that I would have told anybody else in the world. It's so fucking embarrassing, you know? Um, so I knew that that had happened, and I knew that it was real, because Mark was only a few years younger than me. He was hot on my tails of having that nervous breakdown. It was easy for him to tap into it. It was the first time we'd ever captured a performance like that. And um, we just knew also that we, after one take, we, we walked away from it. We were like, okay, we got that. Whatever that was, we got that. Um, but it was so different from anything that we had ever conceived or thought we would do. You know, and then when it played at Sundance and you guys, the crowd had this reaction and also another reaction, which you didn't have because we're alive right now, but half the Sundance crowd was also like scared he was going to kill himself. <laughs> like that was seriously like the questions we were getting is like that was the most hilarious film we've seen at Sundance but also we were afraid he was gonna shoot himself in the head. Um, so it was like this weird thing, and it was really not anything smart about us. It was just we saw people laugh at us hard, and we were like, I guess that's what they want from us. <laughs> just keep doing that. 
But then how did you sort of push that forward and sort of in some ways recapture and expand that very carefully? Yeah, we, we really try to stay close to it. Our next film was uh, another short film. This time it had two actors in it, really branching out. It still happened in a kitchen. It still shot in a kitchen. <laughs> and, and, um, and then we went to Sundance with that. And then we thought, okay, uh, it might be time for us to consider making a feature film, but like last feature film we made was terrible and we were so scared we had that sort of like PTSD. So we were like, we know how to make a seven minute scene work. Let's make a movie that's like, let's do the math, 12 seven minute scenes. That'll be an 84 minute movie. We feel like we can pull that off. And then we again went right into Jay's available material school of thinking where I was like, I was a musician and I had a van. Um, my wife Katie lived in this very small town in Maine where we could shoot a lot of stuff and people would be friendly to us. And we, you know, were like, "Ooh, there's this furniture store going out of business. We can get two matching recliners for five hundred dollars. That way, we can light one of them on fire. That'll be fucking awesome. That'll be like the big effect of the movie." Um, and so we cobbled together the puffy chair out of out of that. And and what was funny about that is what we really thought like most people did, like that would be a stepping stone to getting us into Hollywood or into traditional filmmaking where we could make money. Um, and so when we had the puffy chair at Sundance and we sold that, we got agents and we, and we moved to LA and, and it was this whole rigmarole of like, well, now you're like, now you've done your Sundance movies and you can be a feature filmmaker in the studio system. And that was wildly different than we expected it to be. And, I mean, one of the things in the book that I appreciated so much is just the practicality of a lot of what you guys are talking about. I mean, a frequent through line in the book is just how to pay your rent. And is it, was it important for you guys to sort of keep that sort of like nuts and bolts practical stuff in the book? And do you think being sort of hyper aware of that stuff is one of the foundational ways that you've had the success that you've had is you maybe didn't overextend, you you know, you, you kept it to like, oh, I have a van, so let's use a van. Yeah, I mean, I think that that process is endemic to our success, that minimalist sort of, I mean, it really boiled everything down to uh, what we think is important in storytelling, which is, you know, story and acting um, in filmmaking it, it's you know it's great if you have a gorgeous film but like you can have a gorgeous film if the story and acting sucks no one cares but if you have a film that has good story and acting and looks like absolute shit people will still love the movie uh, maybe like some you know nervings are not going to like it but like you know if they feel it and we felt that and we honestly that process of I mean, when we made these movies, $3, the second one was like 50 bucks, you know, um, the puffy chair was $10,000 to produce. And it was truly, what is the cheapest amount of money that we can make this movie for? You know, like, don't use movie magic budgeting software. Start with a piece of loose leaf and write the 14 things down that you have to buy so that the movie can happen. And then people who don't want to be part of a rinky-dink movie like that, you want to eliminate them from your set. It like weirdly boiled everything down to like, you know, Mark was talking about the puppy chair and these available materials and Katie it was with Mark and she had to do it. Um, and like I had this friend Rhett who played the brother and it was the, the criteria was like Rhett's really interesting and he'll do anything. <laughs> that was like the criteria for him being in the movie. He'll do anything we say because he's got nothing going on. <laughs> um, he was, you know, like at the time he was like, hey man, you want to come to my apartment and share an orange with me? I have this beautiful orange. <laughs> that was like how busy he was. <laughs> and, and we have continued that now I mean like when we make a movie even if we make a movie in the studio system Mark and I we will pull the budget back I mean when we made Cyrus for Searchlight no one had ever made a movie in the studio system for seven million dollars I mean they were like yeah we've never gotten it under ten and we we're like the, we can get it under ten we could make that movie now for three hundred thousand um, dollars but you know we were trying to be minted as studio people at that time but that 
today, that is our philosophy, is make the movie as cheaply as humanly possible. So that, you know, for instance, if you make a movie and you go to Sundance, if you make the movie for $200,000 and it has a couple of famous people in it, it's going to make its money back. Um, and if you get really lucky, maybe you sell it for a million dollars and then every man makes a ton of, a ton of money. And that was kind of our journey. It's like we realized when we made like our little movie Baghead and subsequent smaller movies like The One I Love and The Overnight and you know, those creep movies that we make and everything, we make them so cheaply. We actually, people kind of look at us and like, that's so great. You have this artistic integrity and you don't care about money. We're like, we kind of do care about money. It's kind of important because it helps us continue to make more movies. We fund our own movies and we make more making those movies by owning them and making them ourselves than if we did getting a paycheck from a studio and it guarantees us that creative control. So it's become kind of seminal for our model. I think we thought, all right, we made Cyrus and Jeff lives at home. It's hard to make a studio movie. You gotta fight a lot to get what you want done. We thought if we keep doing this, we're gonna be burned out by the time we're 50. So we kind of took a step back down into the Sundance world and the independent world. And that's pretty much what we do now is try and make these movies on our own dime and, and make them very cheaply because you get to kind of stay around. You know, like if your movie doesn't blow up, it's not a big deal because it didn't cost that much money. And that's really important to staying vital. And we felt like the message we're hearing in the independent film world right now is like, nobody will give me any money to make my movie. I've got this $12 million movie I want to make with no stars that's about incest and rape. <laughs> and we're like, I think you should make that movie for $1,000 <laughs> and then sell it for $10,000 and you'll be a wild success. Nobody should give you $12 million to make that movie. It's not the right time. So we, we kind of felt like being pragmatic and fiscally responsible is something that we wanted to put out in the book because it's a big part of serving our creative. Well, it's really exciting. I've always found so interesting about the two of you and the way that you work is that I, I feel like in your trajectory, you sort of like just snuck in the door, but while the sort of the, the idea was you'd make a short film, would play a festival, you'd make a feature, yeah. would play a festival, you would sell it, then some, you know, someone would get in and work with a distributor or a studio. Like you guys were following the path that you were supposed to, and you can tell me if you feel like that was working or not, but it seems like you made a decision to like go down this sort of other path and to work in a different way, and like once you kind of got in and you started working in the conventional way, what changed? Like why didn't you just like continue down that path? I mean, we, we were incredibly steadfast in curating the way that we made things together. I mean, we make things unusually. We work in a sort of like weird communism. I mean, we are anti-auteur. We are, we have visions about things, but like, because there's two of us, it's not about a, dicta a, a dictatorial vision. It's more like, hey, we're here, we're trying to capture this feeling. Let's try and get some lightning on a set. Like that thing happened. And that doesn't work in the studio world. It doesn't work in the studio. They don't like that. But we did a lot of, Things like, for instance, when we work in the studio world, we're like, oh, when you say cut, 50 people rush on set. We can't have that. And also we can't have 50 people staring at our actors because we make these intimate movies and what we feel like we have to offer are like genuine performances. So we cleared everybody off the set and we put them in a garage that had monitors and they didn't like it very much. But when they saw the footage, they were like, okay, we get it. We get what you're doing. So everything sort of worked moving into the studio system where the buck stopped was with the studio heads. And we're talking, I mean like, we're talking about super smart people who have been a part of making very good movies, who were giving us a $7 million movie based on a $10,000 feature. So we were making a huge leap, which we also recommend people don't do. But the, the main difference is that we, we had to have a million conversations about what we were making and our process is a process of discovery and so they were making us nail down all these things and when we couldn't nail them down they assumed that we were weak and that we didn't have vision they needed they want an answer that you know the answer to everything that's going to make your movie good before you go in and here's the deal there are a lot of people that can go in those rooms with baseball, baseball caps chewing gum who are very eloquent and can answer those questions very well and confidently and they're not always the best filmmakers, which is crazy. And we thought like, well, you know what's worked for our collaboration through the years? 
validation, listening, admitting that we maybe not know best. And when we did that with the studio heads, that was the exact impression we got. It's like, they don't really know what they're doing. And, they're, and, and it wasn't until something crazy happened. I mean, look, we're, we're still friends with all these people and we love them and we've transcended this, but on like day four or five of filming Cyrus, we're coming from the independent world. We're directing Academy Award winner Marissa Tomei, Academy Award nominee John C. Riley, and like Jonah Hill right off of Superbad in the middle of movie stardom. And so we're trying to earn their trust. We're doing great. And, and Fox Searchlight tells us that they want us to reshoot the first scene we shot because it's too brown and too down and we want to add some throw pillows to the apartment. <laughs> and we were like, this is going to be tough for us to tell our actors that, so that they, we need to reshoot the scene, it could blow our trust. And, and it, it really came to a head and I kind of lost my temper and I started screaming. And I was just like, doing the thing. You spoke sternly. I spoke sternly. <laughs> um, I was doing the thing on accident that the baseball hat gum chewing directors do. And in that moment, they were like, oh, they have vision. <laughs> oh, look at this. They know their thing. And that killed us. We were just like, is this is what is required to do this. In hindsight, we were being naive. When you have someone else's money and a lot of money, you need to secure it for them and make them feel good like it's going to make their money back. That's why when people hear that, like, you know, there was this whole article going around a couple of weeks ago about how we had, like, once turned down a Marvel movie. And they were like, what? That's crazy. But we were like, if we're to, we had trouble directing a $7 million movie. If we were to have to deal with, like, a $200 million product, you have to be responsible to them. It's almost not about a piece of art at that point. It's about servicing a product, you know? So we were a little naive, thinking like, yeah, they gave us $7 million, they love our movie, let us go discover it on set. I understand why they needed to know that. So now we just tuck ourselves away, and just say, hey, totally get it, let us just do our thing, we'll make it cheaply, and we'll kind of gouge you when we sell it back to you. <laughs> I've always liked the idea of you guys making a Marvel movie, because I always thought it would be like, everybody's waiting in the van or something. Like it wouldn't be an action <laughs> We're pretty sure if we made a Marvel movie, it'd be like, there'd be a really long, like, eight-minute scene before he leaves his house, and he's really confiding in his wife about how fat he looks in his spandex, <laughs> and he can't possibly go out there. And he's, de he's dealing, he's got low testosterone, and he has to take the low-T medication. <laughs> and also, one of you motherfuckers is not cleaning the blender in this house, and this is going to come to a head right now. <laughs> I just think we, we ultimately like realize you have to spend three years of your life and doing only that. And we like to make like 15 things a year and spread ourselves around. And so we ultimately feel like we wouldn't be happy doing that. They wouldn't be happy with us for sure. Because we'd be fussy and talking about discovery. And they'd be like, it's $200 million. There's no discovery. Which I would totally understand. They'd also be like, read the fucking comic book, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's already written. It's already written. And so, yeah. And then to the larger point of that, and this is part back to where Jay and I are right now, it's like our collaboration for so many years, because we had failed and we found this is John, right? And so we were like, well, it's got to stay in, in the two of us because we got to protect it, make sure it doesn't get diluted or get bad. But then as we got a little better in our craft and started to realize, like, we don't want to just tell only the stories that we can tell. We realized we wanted to collaborate with a lot more people. And that's how we started producing people's things, which is like, I mean, honestly, how it really started was our friends needed money and we were the only people who had money, so we would give it to them. But, but it, it led to like, oh, this is really great. Like, we can produce a movie like Tangerine, which we are not authorities to tell that kind of story well, but Sean Baker kills it. And he just needed our guidance and our money and some protection. And, and so it, that has allowed us to, you know, make a show like Wild Wild Country, which we like can't make that, but we can foster that and govern that. But you can't do that when you're directing Marvel movies. You just, you, know, you can't spread yourself around like that. And that spreading around, collaborating with lots of people has allowed us some of that space we're looking for, where we can like develop relationships with other people and have those kinds of intimacies. So it's been very good for us. And now, Cyrus and Jeff live at home. I'm very interested to know how the what the two of you just think of those movies now and how you feel about them. Love them. Well, no, just in the sense that 
on the one hand, they seem now like paths that you sort of didn't take. I don't know if for you they felt like that was some sort of creative cul-de-sac that you thought you were going to get stuck making movies like that. Or like, in some ways, those movies should have been your sort of pinnacle and this springboard to like even bigger movies. Yes. And you guys didn't treat them like that. And so how do you, how do you feel about whatever that sort of like phantom limb is now? Well, I mean, I think, you know, when we were coming up, we wanted to be the Cromer Brothers, but we let go of that, but we are still holding on to being writer-directors, holding on to each other, and moving into what we wanted to do, and, and back then, this was the dream for independent filmmakers, is to move through Sundance and come into Fox Searchlight and make Sideways. You know, that's what everybody was trying to do, is make 10 to $20 million great artistic movies with big movie stars, um, and when we arrived, that model died. I mean, basically, you know, to, to do the math of it, um, you know, Cyrus um, was a $7 million movie that only made $10 million, and a lot of people are very surprised by that because people, the movie was critically acclaimed, it was very funny, it was very moving emotionally, it was everything that a movie like that is supposed to be. And we were like, why did it only make $10 million? And then when we made Jeff Who Lives at Home, I think Jeff Who Lives at Home only made $4 million. And that same, right after Jeff Who Lives at Home, we produced Safety Net Guarantee, which was a $750,000 movie that also made $4 million. And it didn't have wildly famous people in it like Jason Siegel. It had me. Yeah. And so we... Honestly, we were coming into that time. I mean, I, I, we're just very adaptable. You yeah, know, that's, we, that's we're just exactly we we just are aware. I mean, I think maybe the one thing that has kept us alive all this time is like we are able to look outside of ourselves. When we made shitty movies in our twenties, we were like, oh, another shitty movie. We weren't like. Hey, you have to see my movie. It's so good because I made it, and you must see it. And we have to get it out in the world. We were like, no, it's a shitty movie. We need to move on. And similarly, when we arrived in Hollywood, we were like, man, these movies aren't working anymore. And we were meeting those people, and they were like, yeah, these movies aren't really working anymore. Yeah, and we kind of knew that, like, if we were to try to stay there, the budgets would get tighter. Um, the studios would come down a little harder on you to make sure they could make the money back. It was happened to be the rising of Netflix and the streaming model and realizing we could sell a lot of these movies that we made independently at Sundance. And it was a life flow thing where we're just like, the energy feels so good to be over here. And I think Jay and I are essentially a little bit more, com a more comfortable kind of under forecasting and, and over performing in that way, you know? Like we really like showing up to Sundance and knowing that like, listen, we made this cheap movie, there's no way it's not gonna make its money back and do well, and like maybe it'll blow up, but like it's certainly not gonna be a, a disappointment in that regard, you know? And um, I think we felt that if we tried to stay in the Cyrus Jeff Lives at Home realm or more, it was gonna really burn us out, because we we love those movies, and, and we got to make the movies we wanted to make, but we had to fight so hard to do it, and now we don't have to fight, and it's just, it's just will last longer, I think. And then, I know this maybe sounds a little funny, it seems like with the model you guys are, where you are, just for you as people, and this is something you talk about a lot in the book, but like you're able to have this really fantastic work-life balance, you seem like you're able to be sort of humans in a way that if you were on that grind of making the movies, or even when you were making it together, it was maybe harder for you. And is that something that also then important for you, just the two of you, to discover is like the way to sort of be people as well as filmmakers. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking a lot about it lately. Like, I'm in this weird phase where like, I'm not really acting in a lot of things and I'm not actively directing anything because that requires 12 to 14 hours a day on set. And my kids are 10 and six and it's fucking board game, homemade pizzas, Austin Powers time in our house. And like, I don't want to miss that shit. And so as a writer and a producer, I can be kind of more nine to five. And, you know, Jay has really had discovered his love of acting recently. And he's able to go explore that and do that. And, and I think our feeling now is like, well, we have this wonderful company of people who can do a lot for us. We've learned how to delegate authority and how to make things work. And the answer for, for me is always like, if there is a 
20% chance that, um, or I should say this more clearly, like if I'm thinking about doing something, you know, I look at it and I say, okay, what happens if I punt this? If I can punt this to someone and there's a 20% chance that they'll do it better or worse than me, it's going to be a wash. So I'm going to punt it and let them do it. And then I look at the things that I'm like uniquely qualified to do, like the things that I really feel like I'm special at, which for me is like I'm great at the vomit draft. That first draft, that's like a B minus, really fast, I'm good at it. And then I give it to my friends and they tell me what to do with it. And I'm really good at like building the architecture of little projects. Like each movie or TV show is like a little startup. And I can see it. I'm like, oh, it's Elizabeth Moss. It'll be me. There'll be some sci-fi elements. We'll shoot in Ted Danson's house because it's nice. And we'll make it this cheap And I know, no, and I, I can see the whole thing, you know. So I stay in that zone and everything else I punt. <laughs> um, I'm, I've had like a reverse midlife crisis realizing that I'm an, I like acting. And uh, I'm coming out, guys. I'm coming out of that cl acting closet. <laughs> Um, Which no one knows how to deal with. It's so weird. All the whole industry. Are like, you're an actor now? They're, they're all... Oh. Everybody's like, all actors are trying to get where you are so they can have creative control. Like, what are you doing? I don't want to hold the whole universe in my arms. I want. I just want to be one guy and, like, jump off a cliff, basically. <laughs> I don't know. It's, a, it's definitely an unusual path. Um, and I don't know. I feel like I'm... I, I'm, I'm kind of the You're guy. You're clearly very comfortable with it. Super comfortable with this. <laughs> I'm kind of the guy in my family. I've always been the guy where uh, words have been used, such as histrionic. I'm the person with a lot of feelings, and um, people are like, "Can you not have all those feelings? You're making us uncomfortable." And now I get paid for that shit. Or you can have them. Just do it in your room. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm, I've just been enjoying, I don't know, it's weird that I discovered it so late and I'm kind of excited about, you know, exploring that and trying to do it as much as possible. And uh, so we've got some questions from the audience that we, that we got before the, the program. Ooh. And so I'm going to read, uh, we're going to go through a few of the audience questions here. So the, uh, the first one, um, how do you see your roles individually and together in shaping the future of the industry? What sort of impact would you like to leave? Well, we feel the future of the industry uh, rests squarely on our shoulders as two <laughs> white men in Los Angeles. The world is uh, its really up to us, guys. Um, our second book's going to be a rule book. Yeah. And if you don't follow it, we give you a fucking ticket. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I think that, like, Jay and I have a little bit of survivor's guilt of, like, we, suck, we struggled for a long time when we see a lot of developing artists and, and people who really have great ideas and passion, we want to help them. And I think so, there's a lot of mentoring going on with us right now, whether that's producing younger people's works or um, you know, just kind of in a more traditional sense. And this book is even a part of that. It's just like trying to offer what we have to people and our platform to let them tell their stories and and, and lift them up. And, and I think that like, you know, if, if we have something unique to offer at this point, it really is similar to what we saw in Richard Linklater when we were 18 and 14 years old, which is like, he was in his late 20s and he was wearing jeans and a pocket t-shirt that was ripped and he had bad self-cut hair and he wasn't that well-spoken and, and we looked at him and we were like, well, if this fucking guy can do it, we can do it. <laughs> and I think that there's something about um, our story, and which is true, it's just like, we just waited at the bus stop for, for forever. We never left the bus stop. We always stayed, and you will catch the bus if you wait at the bus stop. And, and the concept of keeping things simple and cheap, because I, we do, we are passionate about the democratization of the filmmaking process. Like right now, if you have an iPhone and a laptop, you can make a gorgeous movie that can change the world. That is fully possible, and anyone in this world can do that. Um, and I still, I mean, I just had a phone call with a guy who's making his first feature for $700,000. I was like, don't make 10 features for $70,000, you moron. I hope he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we are very passionate about helping people avoid the stumbling blocks that we've had and helping people really realize that a budget really can start with a piece of loose leaf paper. 
And also there's a couple questions here having to do with short films. Yeah. In part, do you think there's an ideal length? Do you like the shortest short film possible or yeah. is it a little longer? And then also, do you think they should be a sort of self-contained artistic expression, like its own thing, or do you see them as like, oh, this is the short that I plan to make yeah. into a feature? Um, the first part of that question, someone gave us great advice a long time ago. They said, make shorts, not longs. And I thought that was really smart. Um, don't make a schlong. Yeah, don't make a schlong. <laughs> so Nobody basically, if you're t talking about like reverse engineering your creativity into a model that's going to be sustainable, make comedic shorts under five minutes, because that's the most highly programmable thing from the film festival standpoint. And in terms of whether it should be a standalone piece of art, or whether like a microcosm of your feature, my very strong response to that is like, get out of your head immediately on that. Think about what is a possible string of two to three minutes of footage that might represent your special sauce and might be entertaining, and just go from there. But we think shorts are great. I mean, it's like, uh, the one, my first question that I ask people when they ask me like, hey, I made some stuff, I'm trying to make a feature, what should I do? My first question is, have you made anything that you can hold in your hand, or it's not DVD anymore, it's a link or whatever, but do you have a link that you can send to people and say, this is who I am, I am proud of this, I, I feel this is an example of my potential. And most people will, will not say yes to that question, and I think that is everyone's job, is to make something great. <coughs> that you esteem as great and that you are proud of and that you say, I'd like to build my filmmaking career on, yeah. on this. And to clarify that, we do feel like most of the things we receive from people when they try to give us stuff, it is people who have made something that is not great yet and they're mystified why it's not getting programmed or working and they're spending all their time trying to market their B-minus movie instead of spending all their time on weekends making $3 films until you make the A movie, and I guarantee you when you make that A movie, you will not be stopped when you make the great movie. You, you can't be stopped. We've seen that with our own stuff. We've had movies that we have like really liked, and we've like gone out and marketed them and pushed them and done everything, and then not a lot of people see them. And then there are other things that we're like, oh, I'll just we'll, we'll drop on Netflix and they're not promoting it, and, and then people catch it and it just blows up because they wanted it. So less time marketing, more time making good stuff. And then just as producers, what are you guys looking for? Like when people are coming to you with, you know, projects, what are the things that you feel like you respond most to? It's tough because we, everybody always asks us, how do you do so many things? Like, do you guys ever sleep? And the, the thing is we run our company in an odd way where we don't accept submissions. We don't read things from people. We don't read scripts that our agents have sent us to produce. The things that we make almost, I mean, there's a few exceptions, but the things that we make are birthed by us and at our company with people that we have either worked with before or that we trust. And so we, we almost make 100% of what we develop, and that's where the efficiency comes from. And that was a hard lesson. Like, we moved to Hollywood and after we made the puffy chair, and our agents were like, we're going to send you all these scripts that you can get up to uh, buy to direct. And we, like, spent time reading a hundred scripts and then we read them and then when we're done we're like none of these are right for us and all the time reading the scripts we could have just gone and made a movie so we really try to just generate things and it's hard but when people come to us and say will you look at my movie will you help me our hearts are like breaking for them but we're like basically saying like look you kind of need to like get that first thing on your own you need to get your own you know, short film down and get that thing programmed and like find it yourself. Because uh, that's another question we have here. Someone asked, "What do you What do you say to a filmmaker who doesn't believe that he or she sort of has it inside of themselves to make the movie that they're trying to get made?" We say maybe you're not a filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not our experience. Usually, it's probably because people are very, people who are coming up to us are probably more confident, but most people we find are probably overconfident. <laughs> I mean, maybe just for our taste because we think we suck all the time. Or we're all, I mean, it's like every time we make a movie, we're just like, oh God, please don't let it suck. Please, please. I mean, it's not like we've arrived anywhere. We're terrified. It's very, very, very hard to make a really great movie. And so that's why we beat the shit out of ourselves and, you know, 
have everyone consult with us and why we go nuts before we like put a movie into the world. I mean, if, if you don't have the confidence, I would just say reduce everything. Make a tiny movie with your best friend and make them do what you want to see them do. Yeah, no, I think, to, you know, to clarify that point, it's it, like Jay and I often get on like a soapbox and preach like, go out there and make your movie and empower, but like we want to be clear sometimes that a lot of people like, they kind of feel like they want to do it and they feel like it might be easy and they're not sure. So we do try to be clear and just be like, look, this may not be the thing for you. It may not be your form. It may not be that. And I think that is okay. You know, we, yeah, writing and directing isn't fun. Yeah. Who it's thinks writing, fun. if you think writing and directing is fun, you're probably making some shitty ass movies. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, that's why I'm doing a lot of acting right now is it is hard. I mean, Mark has the best metaphor I've heard for it. If like, if writing and directing is like being the mother of a difficult child and raising it to fruition, um, being an actor is the drunk uncle who shows up at Christmas with Oreos and wins the day. I mean, it, it's not, and then goes home and doesn't have to take care of anybody. Goes home and watches Netflix. Yeah, it's a really, really, I mean, directing in particular is, is the hardest thing I can imagine. I mean, it's a really, really hard thing to do. And, I'm always like skeptical when I'm on a set and there's a director who's having a great time. Because I'm just like, you're not paying attention, dude. Because there's a thousand things happening right now and you're not watching. I mean, Mark and I, I mean, Mark's a little better than me, but like, we're pretty anti social on set. People are like, hey, can we come to set? And we're like, fuck no. I mean, like, seriously, when we made Cyrus, Ridley Scott produced it, he wanted to come to set, and we told him no. <laughs> we couldn't handle it. We, we were just like, we have our hands full. The last thing we need is like Ridley Scott watching us direct John C. Riley, Jonah Hill, Marissa Tomei, and Catherine Keene. <laughs> and then uh, another question here. Honestly, is it ever too late? Oh, I don't think so at all. I mean, you know, I think for, for us, and Jay hit this a little bit, but like, the most exciting thing about the filmmaking world right now is like someone who is 13 years old or 85 years old can literally just pick up their iPad and make a movie and I truly believe that that movie can win the Oscar because the technology is there and people are ready to accept anything. The star system is broken down. It's like just because Matthew McConaughey is in a movie, people don't come see it anymore so they're looking for great, unique, original stories, and I really think it can break through, you know? Um, I think it's a little bit of a tough time because because there are so many movies out there now because of that, it's a little harder to, to cut through. Like, Jay and I honestly were in a really good place in 2005 to have the Puffy Chair because it was a little less competitive then. I think, I think if we submit the Puffy Chair to Sundance, in 2019, it doesn't get in, you know? Um, and so it's a little tougher, but it is exciting that I think, honestly, anybody can come through. Yeah, I don't think people, I, I mean, I, I feel like I don't hear this being talked about enough that like Barry Jenkins was a quote unquote mumblecore filmmaker alongside me, Mark. We were on festival tours with him. His previous movie to Moonlight was Medicine for Melancholy. It's a, it's a really good movie. It's, it's a nice, solid mumblecore movie. Yeah. Um, for an African American who has not made a Crusher great movie to make basically what, a million, $1.2 million dollar movie about gay black men in America and to win the Oscar is insane. It's unheard of. It's like considering where he came from and the context of all that and that a $1.2 million movie can look that good. All of that to me is is super exciting. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of things to be scared about in terms of like what's happening to film, but the process has been democratized in a great way. We have a long way to go for sure, but it's happening. And then I'm going to sort of save the last question for, for myself, and it kind of has to do with the book and just how you guys think of it. Do you see this as some kind of farewell? Like, is in some ways, is the book a way for you guys to kind of say goodbye to the Duplass brothers and to let everybody kind of meet Mark and Joe? I think there's a little bit of, like, 
come meet the individuation of Mark and Jay. Um, but it's definitely not a goodbye to the two of us. I think that, like, the if I had to kind of be reductive about it, I would just say um, we're in an open marriage right now, really. Um, we still love each other. Uh, we're going to sleep with some other people. It's going to feel real good. Um, and then, but we will all... The sex is always best with the two of us, really. We'll always come, we'll always come running back, back home to that. Um, and I think that, you know, the reason we wanted to share it in this book is that we felt like for a long time, everybody's asking us, how do you work with your sibling without killing each other? And we've been trying to do that in hour-long interviews like this for years, and we felt like we had to write a 320-page book to even scratch the surface of it. Um, but I think that a lot of people think that it's a lot easier than it is for us, and we wanted to kind of open that up to people and let them know that, like, it's really hard, but it's so worth it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, I would say it's, like, partially a goodbye to that lockstep. We're going to do everything together. We're going to write and direct everything together. I mean, that that is changing. But, you know, as a company, it's us supporting each other in terms of doing the things that that we want to do and helping each other do it, that's great. But, I mean, to be honest, for me, it feels like uh, I get my brother back and more of a hello to Jay and Mark. You, you guys just don't get to be there. Because <laughs> we're going on hikes and we're hanging out now like we haven't before. And you should that. see Jay in his hiking gear, you guys. <laughs> Dude. It's so much. It's a whole other panel. We'll get into it. I wear a vest. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, hey, everybody, it's Jay. Thank Mark. you. Guys. I tell you, we all need inspiration, and the Duplass brothers are that, especially for me, uh, about just guys who are just persistent and just, you know, they had. 10 years, 12 years of failure before they finally got something to get off the ground and that persistence uh, of, of going after it and making it and figuring things out for themselves and not falling into what everybody else wanted them to do, but for them to find their own voice, their own way of doing things. And I respect that tremendously. Uh, and, to, and they are still an oddity in the Hollywood world and in the Hollywood system. They still uh, walk to the beat of their own drum and and are successful doing it and working with Netflix and working with HBO and working with you know huge companies and doing what they want to do. So again, and I've I've, I've preached this so 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 many times on this show. Don't go and make a seven thousand. Don't go make a seven hundred thousand dollar first feature. Go make ten seventy thousand dollar features. And I would even go farther than that, and 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 you can actually go and make a twenty features with that kind of money, uh, or ten or fifteen features with that kind of money, and learn along the way where you can actually set yourself up for success, um, especially in today's world and what you're trying and what the business is looking like today, and 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 what the marketplace is looking for today. So uh, again, um, and if you and I want to really stress, if you have not read their book, like brothers. It is a wonderful read. I put it up there with Rebel Without a Crew, director Robert Rodriguez's mythical book on El Mariachi and the making of El Mariachi. It is definitely up there. And, it, and in many ways, I feel that it's a little bit more realistic of what these guys did. They took everyday uh, gear and made their movie and made two short films, then made a feature, and then went to the Hollywood system figured it out after two movies that the way Hollywood wanted them to be, they it, they just weren't comfortable with. So they pulled back, went back into the indie world, um, and then started doing things the way they wanted to do it and and told Hollywood, hey, if you're going to work with us, this is how we work and, and, and have complete creative control along the way and make money and help their friends. It is – it's honestly the – it's a win-win. It's a dream style way of making films and definitely check out their book. I'm going to put links to the book in the, in the show notes at IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash 241. And also in the show notes, I'm going to put a link to uh, Mark Duplass's legendary now keynote at the 2015 South by Southwest uh, Film Festival 
where he basically says the cavalry is not coming. And it is a must see for every filmmaker out there has to watch this amazing hour long keynote that Mark Duplass puts on at the festival. It is mind blowing. It really, really is. So a lot of filmmakers ask me, what should I do first? Go make a $3 short film. Go do it right now. While you're listening to this, start figuring out what you're going to go shoot this weekend and go shoot a $3 feature, a $3 feature, no, $3 short film. And after you can, you feel that you've got something, you've got that special sauce, that thing that makes you, you, and you've got that voice that's on that film. Don't care how it looks. Just put it on, uh, put it on there. And like Jay Duplass said, people will forgive a bad looking movie and a bad sounding movie if the story is there. And when you're starting out, that's what you got to do. Get the story done because we could always add the technical stuff. Look how many beautifully technical movies there are in Hollywood that are garbage because the story is not there, but it looks beautiful. We're looking for stories. That's what Hollywood's looking for. So master that first. Then worry about all the other aspects of filmmaking, which you will learn along the way as well. And in the show notes, I'll throw a couple little extra bonus videos in there of the boys as well. And again, definitely check out their book, Like Brothers, is definitely an amazing read. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 